Good evening and welcome to the Arts and Humanities Faculty Research Series in 2021. I'm Hussein Kassim, Professor of Politics at the University of East Anglia, Senior Fellow of the UK and Exchange Europe, and convener of this series after Brexit, Dystopia or, um, or Utopia. In these fortnightly events, we'll be hearing leading figures discuss their views about the future, the role that the UK should play in the world, the UK's relations with its closest neighbour, and whether global Britain is a realistic um, vision. Normally we'd be meeting in, the, in Norwich Castle, but we're having to convene online this year for reasons we're all too familiar with. I'm delighted to welcome you to our third event. Um, in previous weeks, we've heard from Daniel Hannan, former Conservative MEP and founder of Vote Leave, and John Bruton, former Irish Taoiseach and former um, EU ambassador to the US. Tonight, uh, we turn to um, Brexit and the future of the United Kingdom as a union. We have a panel format, and I'm delighted to introduce um, three distinguished panelists. Nicola McEwen is Professor of Territorial Politics in the School of um, Social and Political Science um, and Co-Director of the Centre on Constitutional Change at the University of Edinburgh. She's also a Senior Research Fellow, UK and Change in Europe, and a Research Fellow in a major ESRC funded project between two unions, the Constitutional Future of the Islands after Brexit. In a change to our program, uh, for which we uh, are apologize, which we apologize, but have had um, very little choice because unfortunately Katie Hayward has had to um, to is, is unavailable this evening. Um, we're very grateful to David Finnamore. Um, David is professor of European politics and John Monet Chair in European Political Science in the University in School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics at Queen's University, Belfast, in Northern Ireland. He's also a visiting professor at the College of Europe in Bruges. He researches EU treaty reform, EU enlargement and EU external relations, focusing especially on association and Brexit. He's published on all those subjects uh, widely. He's currently also coordinating a project, um, an ESRC funded research project on the governance for a place between the multi-level dynamics of implementing the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland. Our third panelist is Dan Wincott. He's Blackwell Professor of Law and Society at the Cardiff University School of Law and Politics and based in the school's Wales Governance Centre. He's director of the Economic and Social Researchers um, Council's Governance After Brexit Research Programme, and he's also research director of the ESRC UK and Changing Europe. So we get, um, we're going to hear from each of our speakers in turn, and we'll then move into Q&A. Um, but I've asked them in their remarks to speak to um, three um, questions. The first is, um, how was the UK's approach to Brexit in the aftermath of the referendum perceived in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland? The second is how the withdrawal agreement and the trade and cooperation agreement viewed in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And the third is, do you think that the UK will exist in its current form in 10, 10 years time? You're very welcome to send your um, questions to me throughout the talk. If you could use the Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen, I'll collect and gather them as we go along. But Nicola, over to you. Thank you so much and welcome. Oops. Thank you. Sorry, just some technical glitches there. Can you hear me okay, Hussein? Can hear you fine. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to be with you virtually and unfortunately, well, maybe the next time it will be in person and I would love to see that castle uh, that you were referring to. Um, so Hussein gave us our homework um, with, with three questions to think about. The first of which uh, was how, is the, how the UK government's approach to, to Brexit um, in the aftermath of the referendum was perceived and I'm going to speak to the Scottish uh, perspective. So the context um, for addressing that question is to recall that um, the Remain Leave dynamic within Scotland is very different. And in the referendum itself, 62% of people in Scotland voted Remain. So it was the strongest um, Remain uh, voting constituent territory of the United Kingdom uh, by some distance. Um, and that um, reflected um, really a kind of almost a lack of um, engagement with the issue in a sense in that all of the political parties um, at the leadership level were at that point in favour of the UK's membership of the European Union. So in a sense, um, the referendum campaign itself seemed somewhat remote um, from 
um, Scotland in a way that the, the previous referendum in 2014 uh, was a very different kind of, kind of experience. So 62% voted remain in every local authority in Scotland, every local authority counting area, there was a remain uh, majority. Um, now, that didn't really matter, of course, to, to the outcome because it was a UK wide ballot. But the idea that the UK is a multinational state, that Scotland is a constituent nation of that union, matters politically in Scotland. And that led to accusations uh, from First Minister Nicola Sturgeon that Scotland was being taken out of the European Union, quote, against our will. And that's a phrase that we've heard a lot uh, throughout uh, the Brexit process. The other immediate impact was that it raised again the question of Scottish independence. Now recall that the, the um, referendum on independence had led to um, a vote against independence by 55% to 45% just two years prior to that. Um, but the, the SNP's line on this, again, often repeated since then, and it was in the previous manifesto in 2016, that was just a couple of uh, the elections, just a couple of months before the referendum itself, was that if circumstances change, including a material change of circumstances, such as the UK leaving the European Union, then it would justify revisiting the issue again. And that was the immediate focus in the immediate aftermath and there was a spike in support for independence. Now that um, died down um, quite quickly. And to begin with, there was a focus, a priority on how can we manage this? Accepting the result of the UK wide vote, how could we um, arrange things so that Scotland maintained a close relationship with the European Union? And to begin with, there was cross-party consensus on that. And the Scottish government's um, Public, first publication, its major publication on Scotland's place in Europe, prioritised the softest Brexit possible for the whole of the UK. So staying within the single market, staying within the customs union ideally, but a very soft Brexit if there has to be a Brexit at all. And failing that, if the rest of the UK chose another path, its priority then was to try to have some distinct um, special status uh, for, for Scotland. Um, within the European Union. Now, that was never really seriously considered. Maybe it was unrealistic anyway, but that's not really the point for the purposes of this talk because it didn't get serious uh, consideration. And that speaks to the broader issue in that the idea um, closely associated with the Brexit process is that Scotland's voice as a nation within the United Kingdom has not been um, heeded, has not been accommodated uh, within the UK, again, reinforcing the nationalist uh, discourse for um, a different constitutional path. One of the things that did happen um, um, in the course of the Brexit negotiations was that there was an intensification of intergovernmental relations through a forum called the Joint Ministerial Committee. That brings together the UK government and the devolved government. They sit around the table, they discuss various things, they don't decide very much, but they, they, they talk about things. And they met more times than they had ever met um, during the course of the Brexit negotiations through a forum called the, the JMC for short, JMC EU negotiations. But meetings is not the same as influence. And what became quite clear over the course of the Brexit negotiations is that the devolved governments had little or no influence whatsoever on the shape of Brexit negotiations and on what Brexit um, turned out to mean. Because the UK government's version of Brexit, as we've seen in the deal, is very far removed uh, from the position championed by the Scottish government and, and the Welsh government too, as Dan will, will probably address. Um, so, all of that reinforced this view that Scotland's voice as a nation doesn't matter. Um, and it has helped to A, reinforce support for independence. We know in the period since 2019 that there have been modest increases in support for independence such that the position now is 50-50. 
Um, and we know that that closing of the gap was generated by those who had previously opposed independence but voted remain, switching sides to a pro-independence position. And if you think back to the 2019 uh, general election, the election that produced um, Boris Johnson's majority, 80 seat majority to get Brexit done, well, not in Scotland. Uh, so in Scotland, it's worth remembering that the SNP reinforced its uh, dominance of Scottish politics then winning 48 out of the 59 uh, seats. Um, and I'll maybe come touch upon uh, the, the most recent elections in a moment. So what's the view of the withdrawal agreement and the, the trade and cooperative cooperation agreement in Scotland? Um, a bit dismal uh, to be frank. Um, it's quite far removed from what the Scottish government and most of the political elites within Scotland would have hoped for um, in that it's at the hard end of the hard soft spectrum of what Brexit could have um, meant. And I did some interviews in the run up to Christmas last year when it was a wee bit uncertain whether there would be a deal at all. And certainly for, from officials perspective, they were indicating that the kind of Brexit deal that was being spoken about suggested that it probably wouldn't make that much difference to them in terms of their preparations um, for what the outcome uh, would be and the, the feelings of optimism were not, were not evident. The fishing communities, important in Scotland symbolically, um, were disappointed with uh, the, the, the Brexit deal Food and drink industries, which uh, rely on exports to Europe, again, disappointed and deeply concerned. Tourism sectors too. And as we're seeing more and more now with not just the, the deal with the European Union, but the negotiating trade deals with Australia and the likes, there are deep concerns um, among key sectors, um, not least agriculture, about the effects that those deals may have on those key uh, sectors. Um, so I'll come to Hussein's final question, which is, a really, really difficult question to answer, which is, do you think the UK will exist in its current form in 10 years time? Um, and, and my honest answer is I have absolutely no idea. Um, in terms of Scottish independence, it's quite clear that Brexit has strengthened the case for independence. It's strengthened the political case for independence, given that um, all that's happened in the context of the negotiations and that very powerful idea about Scotland's voice and the influence that um, and the ability of the UK to accommodate preferences, political preferences um, within Scotland. That's really quite hard to see now. Um, the elections that we have just had um, a couple of weeks ago um, has, have definitely strengthened um, the mandate for an independence referendum to see it as otherwise, because the SNP fell one seat short of a majority, is to impose the logic associated with majoritarian political systems onto a proportional representation system. I could give you the stats and the data, but you know, uh, later maybe. Um, but it, it's unquestionably for me a very, very comfortable um, election uh, victory that the SNP had, and coupled with uh, the this the um, increased members of the Scottish Green Party, which is also a pro-independence party, it's quite clear that there is now a pro-independence majority in the parliament. And what that means is that if a referendum bill comes to the parliament chamber, it will have majority support. But the legal authority over the referendum is in some doubt. Ultimately, it will require the consent and the willingness of the UK government to negotiate the outcome of a yes uh, vote in a referendum, even if, um, and it's in a big if, um, the courts would decide that it didn't necessarily require uh, their um, authority for holding a referendum in the first place. And that's a whole, a whole other issue. But even if a referendum is held, there is no guarantee that yes would win because while Brexit strengthens the political case for independence, it also complicates um, independence as well. It's not the only thing that complicates it. COVID complicates it. The decline of Narsi oil complicates it. But Brexit it complicates independence. And it does so in particular because of the effect on the border between Scotland and England. And here I'll, I'll 
refer to what I'm sure we'll hear more of from David uh, later. Um, but we've seen the importance of borders and the regulatory border between the United Kingdom and the European Union. And if an independent Scotland were to fulfill its ambitions to rejoin the European Union, then that Anglo-Scottish border would become a border between Scotland and what remains of the United Kingdom. And it would have to be managed and there would be border uh, barriers in place. So whatever the outcome, relationships on these islands will still matter, even if there is independence, even if there is a fundamentally, dif fundamentally different set of constitutional relationships. Some decisions made by the UK government will still affect Scotland by virtue of its size. Some policy challenges will still be shared by virtue of sharing the same islands. Thank you. Nicola, thanks very much. Um, Anne. Thank you. Um, so uh, we've all been set the same three exam questions. Uh, the first one is, um, how is the UK government's approach to Brexit uh, perceived in the aftermath of the referendum in Wales? Uh, and I want to divide that into, uh, into public perceptions and perceptions of the Welsh government. Um, uh, at, at, at the level of public perceptions, I think it's really important to stress that Wales is probably the part of the United Kingdom that has the most kind of complicated pattern of, uh, uh, of, of national identities in, in, in the UK. Um, so there is a very substantial proportion of the population that lives in Wales that was born in England and identifies as English. Some of those are professionals who've moved to Wales to work in universities and, uh, and similar institutions. Um, but a lot of them are also people who retire to Wales from, from, from England. Um, then you have uh, people who are born and bred in Wales um, who identify nevertheless strongly as British. Um, and you have also have some people who identify strongly as Welsh. And, and in general, those two identities, uh, there's something of a tension between them in Wales in a way that is much less true in England. So in England, it's very easy to express your Englishness through the same kinds of institutions and symbols as you'd express your Britishness. Um, you know, the... Uh, the monarchy, for example, uh, would be a symbol both of Englishness uh, and of Britishness uh, in England. Uh, and that's much less true in, in Wales uh, or indeed in, in, in Scotland. And then layered over that in Wales, you also have a, uh, a difference of language. So there are parts of Wales where the Welsh language is, you know, the language of the streets of the, of the hearth and home. Uh, and then most of Wales, uh, uh, the largest population centres in Wales are predominantly English speaking. And these differences uh, of identity make a big difference to how people in Wales uh, voted in the Brexit referendum uh, and also to how they responded to um, uh, the UK government's approach after, after Brexit. Um, so generally speaking, the more strongly someone identifies as Welsh in Wales, the more likely they were to vote uh, to remain uh, and the more um, sceptical or hostile they would be um, uncertain at, at any rate, they would be about the approach taken by, by the UK government. Um, all that having been said, unlike Scotland and Northern Ireland, you know, as is well known, a majority of people in Wales voted to leave. So um, the, the, the sort of standard line uh, after the referendum was that England and Wales had voted one way and Scotland and Northern Ireland had voted another way. Um, and uh, that certainly created, I think, something of a, um, something of an issue for the uh, leadership of, of most of the political parties in Wales who were, um, clearly on the 
pro-Remain side of the debate during the referendum. Um, although as in Scotland, there was a devolved election just before the referendum uh, and in Wales as a kind of um, uh, aperitif to the referendum, that election did generate through the list system, uh, I think seven UKIP uh, members of what was then the National Assembly for Wales. Uh, so you can see that there is a much stronger body of support uh, for Brexit. Uh, it was a position that was much more clearly articulated, um, you know, and you, you, you I, I saw people, you know, train stations and bus stations wearing, um, you know, no deal, no problem t-shirts, as well as seeing people wearing t-shirts that, that uh, um, you know, had symbols of the EU on them. So, so there was a sense, which differs, I think, from Scotland, of there being a real division in Wales around uh, around the Brexit issue at the at the um, at the level of public opinion, um, and that has played through in uh, interesting ways through the various uh, elections um, since the Brexit referendum. Although we've ended up in the most recent devolved elections uh, in a position which I think re-emphasises differences between Wales uh, and England. Um, so in Wales. Uh, lot, the, the, the people who had supported pro-Brexit parties, uh, so um, reform or, or UKIP uh, or, um, you know, before that, the, the Brexit party, uh, seem to have split uh, more equally in going back to supporting both Labour and the Conservatives, whereas in England, there seems to have been much more of a, 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 a flow from supporting UKIP and pro-Brexit parties into supporting um, conservative candidates uh, in, the, in, the, in the local elections that we've just had. Um, so there's that um, distinctive aspect of Wales as a, as a devolved nation within the UK compared to Scotland uh, and, and Northern Ireland. Um, at an elite level, though, it was clear from the very beginning that, as in Scotland, um, whilst the political leadership in Wales um, very clearly uh, acknowledged and in one sense accepted the Brexit referendum result that they were keen to push for what you might call the softest possible Brexit. Um, having said that, um, as Nicola has pointed out in relation to Scotland, uh, the the Welsh government was kept out of the uh, the Brexit negotiations. So I'd say most of the action, most of the concern, um, most of the focus of Welsh politicians has been on the domestic, institutional, and political implications of Brexit, rather than having a direct influence on the terms uh, on which the UK left the EU. The two, of course, are connected, though, and the choices made by UK governments, initially by Theresa May, uh, you know, when arguably she didn't really know what Brexit meant, so she said Brexit means Brexit, uh, and set out a series of very demanding red lines for the negotiation. Um, uh, and then when she had tried to, to find a way of uh, working around those red lines uh, in ways I'm sure David will go on to talk about in relation to Northern Ireland to accommodate the position of Northern Ireland uh, uh, after Brexit. Uh, and that ran into the ground and Boris Johnson took over and also pursued uh, a very hard Brexit, but one that um, was, uh, was, was aimed at minimizing constraints on Great Britain, certainly, uh, in any Brexit deal. Um, those changes have very immediate and direct implications for the internal organization of, of the UK. Um, Nicholas talked about the Joint Ministerial Committee on European Negotiations um, uh, and as she said, that met much more frequently um, during the period of, uh, uh, of 
negotiating the UK's Brexit uh, uh, terms. Um, but I think it's important to emphasize that those meetings uh, had something of a kind of chaotic quality to them. Um, they, were, they were sort of, there was a sense of that process being sort of made up uh, as it went along. Um, the current first minister in Wales, Mark Drakeford, uh, before he became first minister, was the key negotiator with the UK government over Brexit. And I can remember once he, uh, he sent out a tweet on a train that had left Cardiff for London for one of these joint ministerial committee meetings, saying that although they'd left Cardiff, they didn't know where in London the meeting was going to be held. You know, they didn't have an agenda for it. Um, uh, so, you know, that was that was quite a chaotic process, although it was a process, particularly whilst uh, David Liddington was in charge at the UK and that was, I think, taken very seriously and became quite an intensive process after a, after a, a chaotic, a chaotic, chaotic start. Um, the the terms that the Welsh government felt that it had managed to negotiate um, around the time of the 2018 EU Withdrawal Act um, were terms that I think the Welsh government felt it could work with. So um, unlike the SNP in Scotland, uh, the Welsh Labour government is a government which is in principle strongly in favour of maintaining the UK in its current form, uh, at the same time as being a strongly pro-devolution party. So it was very concerned to try and create institutions and practices and processes that would allow the UK uh, to operate more effectively uh, after Brexit than, um, uh, than it had done before or through the Brexit processes. Um, so, you know, like the Scottish government, the, the, the Welsh government passed through the Assembly in Wales some continuity legislation of its own, which actually got on the statute book uh, in, in, in Wales. Um, but the Welsh government then agreed to withdraw it uh, on the basis of um, agreements to try and create common frameworks for managing policy divergence um, and to create a more intensive pattern of intergovernmental relations between uh, uh, the various different governments in the UK. At that stage, the Scottish government um, uh, didn't give consent to the withdrawal agreement and sought to uh, continue to pursue its continuity uh, legislation. So there's, a, there's an important difference there, although it has to be said throughout this period, the Scottish government and the Welsh government worked very closely together. Uh, and then Theresa May was uh, defenestrated um, and Boris Johnson became the UK Prime Minister. Uh, and from that moment on, I think the relationships between the Welsh government and the UK government deteriorated uh, very rapidly. Um, uh, and by the time of the passage of the uh, withdrawal agreement uh, and the um, trade and cooperation agreement, I'd say that the relationship between the Welsh government uh, and the UK government was worse than I've ever known it to be. Um, uh, there was really a, an almost complete collapse of cooperation through that, through that period. Um, uh, it's quite remarkable, actually, that the various governments in the UK worked together so effectively in the early stages of the coronavirus pandemic, given that uh, they went into that pandemic uh, with relationships really in a, in a dreadful, dreadful state. Um, And then the, uh, the UK government uh, sort of doubled down on its new approach to um, managing the relationship between its own prerogatives, you know, having taken back control uh, from the EU, it, it started to feel as if the UK government was also looking to take back control from devolved governments. Um, I've alluded to the fact that the Scottish government didn't give consent to the withdrawal uh, Act of 2018, uh, the Scottish government uh, also didn't participate in discussions and negotiations around the construction of an internal market for the UK. Uh, the Welsh government did, 
uh, Welsh Government officials continued in those negotiations through the early stages of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, they were in those discussions around this time last year. Uh, and then about a month before the UK government released its white paper on the Internal Market Act, uh, uh, the UK government stopped cooperating with Welsh government officials on the Internal Market Act unilaterally. Um, so the Welsh government was cut off from those negotiations and the white paper um, appeared as, uh, as, as a kind of edict from Whitehall and Westminster. Uh, and that really went down very badly indeed. Then when the initial draft of the bill was published, and again, we may hear something about this from, from David, you know, very famously, the UK government, uh, UK government ministers said explicitly that they were looking to um, uh, break international law or that they were minded to break international law around uh, um, uh, the uh, question of Northern Ireland. And, and, and you know, that was obviously a, a very serious issue. Um, but the structure of the white paper is, uh, is itself instructive and the pattern of uh, regulatory governance that it introduces is instructive. So uh, that legislation doesn't take away the right of the Welsh government or indeed the Scottish government to pass regulations on uh, various aspects of uh, market activity, you know, things like single use plastics. Um, but what it does is it, uh, it makes it impossible for them to regulate uh, products produced in other parts of the UK or imported into other parts of the UK if they meet the regulatory standards of that other part of the UK. So, um, you know, the, the Welsh government could ban single use plastic coffee stirrers that were made in Wales, but if they were made in England, uh, they couldn't prevent them being lawfully marketed in Wales. That's the uh, uh, nature of the market access principles in the internal market. Um, so uh, that, I think, was a form of, of, of regulation that was widely seen by the Welsh government, and I think also by the Sp Scottish government, as a kind of form of, a, uh, of power grab. Uh, and that's not the only thing that the Internal Market Act introduced. So, you know, it's long been possible for the UK government to spend money on major projects in, uh, in Scotland and Wales. Uh, there's a whole slew of city deals which are agreed uh, between uh, local government actors, you know, with, uh, with uh, some involvement from the Scottish and Welsh uh, governments respectively for, you know, Cardiff and Swansea Bay and North Wales. In, in, in Wales, for Edinburgh and various other places in, in Scotland. Um, but the Internal Market Act gives the UK government the right to spend money, or I mean, it, not exactly even that it gives them the right, it, it sets out uh, um, the terms on which they can spend money uh, on major projects uh, in Wales, uh, that would normally be seen as falling under devolved competence in Wales um, and do so uh, over the heads and against the wishes of the Welsh government. So the, the sort of totemic example here in Wales is a bypass near Newport on the M4. Um, there are some tunnels uh, called the Bringlass Tunnels near Newport where the motorway goes down to two, two lanes. It's a notorious bottleneck. The Welsh government had done a lot of work uh, uh, looking into developing a bypass to extend the capacity of the M4, and in the end decided not to pursue it, partly because the road would go through a um, ecologically sensitive region, but also I think on the on ecological grounds that you know if you build more roads they'll just fill up with more traffic, and what was needed instead was uh, an alternative that was more focused on. Um, on public transport. Boris Johnson on several occasions, initially looking to, I think, encourage people to vote for the Conservatives in devolved elections, uh, but then in the context of the Internal Market Act, um, uh, uh, simply said that the UK government would was minded directly to fund 
the M4 bypass, um, uh, whatever the Welsh government said about it. Uh, there's a phrase that's used repeatedly, uh, um, unblocking the nostrils of the Welsh dragon is the phrase, you know, applying Vicks inhalers to the Welsh dragon, sort of uh, um, describing this east-west motorway as, uh, as, as a major blockage to the economic success of, of Wales. Um, practically speaking, it's very difficult to see how this project could be run from London over the heads of the Welsh government. It, it, you know, technically it could be done, um, but it would need to find ways of getting past, for example, the planning requirements uh, that would run through the Welsh government for a major infrastructure development of this kind. Um, uh, and it's a really uh, quite abrasive approach to intergovernmental relations, to the relationship between the UK government and the Welsh government to take on new powers um, and to propose using them in ways that directly countermand established policy from, from Wales. Um, and that, I think, really takes me on to the, to the final question about whether the UK will exist in, in 10 years time. Uh, and, you know, a bit like Nicola, uh, as a big question, I'm just gonna duck it. Uh, uh, if the big question is, will the UK exist with its current external territorial boundaries? Um, uh, I think that's very difficult to, uh, to judge or assess at this stage. Although I think it's uh, unquestionably the case that uh, the external territorial boundaries of the UK are under more pressure now than they were uh, than they have been uh, um, uh, for, for, for a long time. Um, but I think there's another way of thinking about that question, uh, which isn't so much, uh, you know, whether the external boundaries of the state will change. And in a way, it picks up on a comment that Nicola made about how relationships amongst the peoples uh, uh, that populate the UK will need to be uh, managed, will need to be um, uh, considered uh, and, and be part of our politics, whatever the constitutional relationships between the different parts of the UK might be. If you look at this from a Welsh perspective, uh, Wales today has a devolution, set of devolution arrangements that are fundamentally different to the set of devolution arrangements Wales had 10 years ago, that are absolutely fundamentally different to the set of devolution arrangements Wales had when devolution first uh, was put in place at the beginning, uh, at the end of the, of the 1990s. In Wales, initially, devolution was like a large scale local government. Uh, the National Assembly still only has a very small number of members. At the time, there was no distinction between government and opposition. There was no separate government in Wales. There was a body corporate uh, uh, the, the, in the National Assembly, which, which governed collectively in a traditional local government model. And over the past uh, 20 plus years, we've moved to a situation where there's a separate Welsh government, a Senate, the Welsh Parliament. So it's no longer uh, an assembly, it's now a parliament. It has primary legislative powers uh, and it, it operates on a reserved powers model, uh, which is similar to the Scottish model. So Wales has seen continual change. Uh, and I think we're going to see more change uh, uh, looking ahead, whatever, whatever happens. That change could be in the direction of an attempted re-centralization on the part of the UK government. Some aspects of the Internal Market Act that I've discussed seem to point in that kind of a direction. If that is the direction of travel, then I think we are set to see a long period of um, abrasive, difficult relationships between the UK government and the devolved governments. Uh, a, a, a sense of kind of deadlock uh, and mutual um, uh, misunderstanding, uh, mutual um, 
uh, hostility even sometimes. And, and some of that has certainly come through in the COVID pandemic uh, that, um, uh, that I can talk about more in questions if people are interested in that. Um, in Wales, that tension will manifest at a mass level in, in interesting kinds of ways. Um, you know, Wales, unlike Scotland and Northern Ireland, basically has the same print media as England. Uh, so in lots of ways, the kind of public discussion is more heavily uh, uh, slanted towards London kinds of perspectives. One of the features of the COVID pandemic has been a real um, rise to prominence of Mark Drakeford, the first minister here, who's a very kind of mild mannered man, not a man you would say uh, was uh, hugely charismatic, but he's, his approval ratings have shot up uh, and his uh, recognition in Wales has increased massively through the COVID pandemic uh, period. Um, uh, and my final point would be to say, you know, that complex mix of identities in Wales um, and now has always included, you know, maybe one in five people whose uh, Welsh identities also predisposed them to favour independence for Wales. Um, but that wasn't a huge part of the public conversation. Uh, it is now much, much more present in public discussion. Uh, there's a civil society movement called Yes Cymru, which, you know, marches from Cardiff city centre to the football stadium every time Wales play an international uh, in, in Cardiff behind these pro-independence banners. So it's a non-party political movement in favour of devolution. And you see their stickers uh, all over the place. Um, so it has a kind of a, a kind of um, daily presence in a way that it never had before. Uh, and I think that thrown into a mix of um, you know, really difficult and abrasive relationships between the Welsh government and the UK government um, could produce some uh, really interesting political dynamics over the next few, few, uh, few years. I'll leave it there. Dan, thanks, thank you so much. Um, David, can we move, move to you, please? Certainly, um, thanks very much. Good evening, everybody. Um, Yes, same, same questions as everybody else. Um, first one to look at from a Northern Ireland perspective is what the reaction was to the UK government's approach to Brexit in the aftermath of the, of the 2016 referendum. Um, Northern Ireland, as with Scotland, voted um, by majority to remain in the, for the United Kingdom to remain in the European Union, um, but not by such a large margin. Um, we saw 56% of the people of Northern Ireland vote um, for, for Remain. Um, I think what's striking about the distribution of the vote, um, it was a very good BBC map at the time, um, the majority vote was essentially along the border. Um, that the closer you were to the border, the more likely you were to remain. Um, that's a reflection of two issues. One, it's, it's a stronger nationalist community um, in, the, in the border region. Um, more people would identify it as Irish there as opposed to, to British. Um, and the further and the other issue was that people were concerned about what Brexit might mean for the border. Um, and I think that, as you're probably aware from following Brexit negotiations over the last um, four or five, four years or so, um, the border was a vitally important um, issue for, for Northern Ireland. OK, um, the initial reaction was essentially quite encouraging. Um, I remember Theresa May standing up and saying that she was going to negotiate on behalf of the whole of the United Kingdom and all the interests of the devolved administrations would be taken into con consideration. Um, and I think it was in, the, in, in response to that, that the um, leaders of Northern Ireland, then the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, um, penned a letter, quite surprisingly, um, in August, outlining some of their initial issues um, for the Prime Minister to think through in terms of negotiating the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from, from the EU. This is a remarkable event because the whole approach to Brexit revealed divisions within, within Northern Ireland, political divisions. Um, the executive, five-party executive, or, or the 
then two-party executive, wasn't united on, on, on Brexit. The DUP um, supported um, Leave, Sinn Féin vehemently opposed it. But the First Minister and Deputy First Minister did pull together a letter indicating there are a serious number of issues which needed to be addressed in the context of, of the UK's withdrawal. Um, I think, though, attitudes began to change very quickly after that, not only because Theresa May took more than two months, I think, to answer the letter and acknowledge the, the, the issues which were being raised, but we get to the Conservative Party conference in um, the autumn of 2016, and Theresa May essentially announces that the UK will be leaving the customs union in the single market. Now, for, for many um, ardent Brexiteers, that was music to their, their ears. But for a lot of people in Northern Ireland, it immediately raised the question, what are you going to do with the border? Because if the United Kingdom is outside the customs union, outside the single market, the border controls for regulating entry into the customs union, the European Union and the single market have to be placed somewhere. And the obvious place is between the border between the United Kingdom and the, the EU. Um, the issue obviously there was that whereas for a lot of the United Kingdom, Great Britain, that's a literal border, it's the sea, um, and it's not particularly problematic, it's the complete opposite in the North Ireland, Northern Ireland case, um, because it's the land border, one of the most contested borders in Western Europe over the last 50 years or, or so. Um, this raised concerns because it suggested, uh, I'd hardly say it demonstrated, the lack of appreciation in London and within, particularly within the Conservative government, of what the implications of a hard Brexit would be for Northern Ireland. I think here we only have to think about some of the language around or the way in which Brexit was discussed. And um, borders, when you look at them from Great Britain, are a fairly simple concept. They are what you traverse when you um, get off your plane, enter um, the airport and go through passport control. They are what happens when you enter um, through Dover, through Felixstowe, through Harwich. Um, in Ireland, it's completely different. The border is something which you cross on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you, you have families across the border. You moved for work across the border. You have supply chains um, across that, that border. Um, and more importantly, the Northern Ireland context, the whole of the peace process since, 19, since the, um, the, the 1990s has essentially been about taking the border out of politics. And if you travel to Northern Ireland, travel to Ireland, you'll, note, you'll, you'll barely notice the border. And many people would actually say one of the key, key successes of the peace process is the removal of the border out of politics. The border has been neutralised, but Brexit brought it very much back into the politics of Northern Ireland and also the politics of Brexit, because clearly Ireland as a member of the European Union was not wanting to see the security um, or, or, or the stability of, of the peace process um, undermined by a return of the border on the island of Ireland. Now, admittedly, the UK government did eventually acknowledge this. Um, and, met, and worked with the Irish government, with the EU, to avoid a situation where the, the border, uh, where, you, where you try to or try and maintain a situation where Brexit um, minimised the impact on, on the border. But clearly, this then raised problems for the nature of the UK's withdrawal from, from the EU. OK, now, I think from the early part of the, the post-referendum period, um, there has been support in Northern Ireland for treating Northern Ireland differently in the context of Brexit because this was going to be the only way you could reconcile the UK government's commitment to come out of the single market and the customs union with maintaining um, a situation where there was no hard border on the, the island of Ireland. Okay. Um, but as, as we know, um, that idea was not one which was entertained particularly enthusiastically by the UK government, um, although ultimately it was forced to agree particular arrangements for Northern Ireland in order to secure a withdrawal agreement. Um, and this is where we go back to the original idea of a backstop arrangement, which would have seen Northern Ireland potentially remain in a customs union with, with the EU on, on um, also the UK in a customs union with, with the EU and some degree of regulatory alignment. But that deal which was struck with the European Union by the UK government um, was one which the Theresa May could not get through through Parliament. Um, now, I think there was a sense that uh, um, 
of clearly that that was not possible um, because of the backbench opposition because the, the corollary of that was to keep the united kingdom as a whole in a customs union and, and a single single market and um, something which was um, rejected um, eventually though we did see um, Boris Johnson come, come to power and his initial response was to um, ditch the backstop um, and indeed insisted that the backstop went. But importantly, in the process of ditching the backstop, what he did was, was accept the, uh, a particular arrangements for Northern Ireland alone. Um, and this is what's caused an enormous amount of concern amongst unionists, um, people who identify in Brit as British. Um, particularly when they supported, many of them supported Brexit. Um, the idea of a post-Brexit arrangement where Northern Ireland is treated differently to the rest of the United Kingdom is anathema to many unionists because they see it as part of an ongoing process of the weakening of Northern Ireland's position within the European Union. And for um, uh, Boris Johnson to adopt a, a, a Northern Ireland only approach, um, differentiated arrangements for Northern Ireland, was to undermine the union, particularly when unionists were opposed to this, this idea. Okay, now the, the upshot of, of that is that um, we, we see um, quite significant levels of distrust in the UK government, um, evident throughout the process of Brexit. Initially amongst many unionists, amongst many nationalists, because um, the UK did not seem to understand the significance of, of the border um, and the need to avoid it in the context of, of, of Brexit. Um, and then subsequently by unionists who, in, while holding the balance of power in London under Theresa May and initially under um, Boris Johnson, were essentially, as we would say, thrown under the bus by Johnson in order to secure a deal which he could get through Parliament, a deal which would treat Northern Ireland differently. Uh, I think it's worth noting here that when the, when the withdrawal agreement went through um, Parliament in the UK, no member, no Northern Ireland MP supported it. Um, so what we ended up with in uh, 2019 um, with the, with the, in the terms of the withdrawal agreement was not something which was actually welcomed by people in Northern Ireland. It was not something that was actually supported by them. That said, when we got to the withdrawal agreement, um, most people accepted that it was probably the least worst option because the arrangements included in the withdrawal agreement, the so-called protocol, at least avoided a situation where there was a return to a hard border on the island of Ireland. Um, so the, 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 it, it has its support, but not as something which is seen as the best possible outcome um, to Brexit in, in Northern Ireland. Um, that said, it is obviously clearly opposed by um, unionists, and we see that ongoing in the, the, uh, the, the politics of Northern Ireland today. But if I just say a few words about what the protocol entails, because what it, it means is that there's going to be significant differentiation between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK as we move forward to that uh, 10 years that we've been asked to, to look at and predict what the UK might look like. Because under the terms of the protocol, Northern Ireland, although formally it is part of the internal market of the United Kingdom, it remains part of the United Kingdom, it's part of the e U e UK's um, customs um, territory, de facto, it is part of the EU's custom territory and it's in the single market for goods, whereas the rest of the UK is outside. Um, what it also entails is dynamic alignment with EU regulations um, in areas which facilitate the free movement of goods and the customs union. Um, dynamic in the sense that where there are um, replacements or amendments to, the, to those regulations, they automatically apply in Northern Ireland. Moreover, if there's new EU legislation coming through, which is designed to ensure the free movement of goods, then the expectation is that that will be added to the protocol. All this is happening at the same time as the UK, the rest of the UK rather, is planning to diverge from the European Union. Um, so you have this tension um, there. And this will lead to a change position for, for, for Northern Ireland. Now, when the protocol was agreed, there was, there was certainly a hope that the nature of the UK-EU relationship might mitigate some of the um, uh, checks and controls that you would have within um, the UK between Great Britain and Northern Ireland as a consequence of the protocol. Um, that did not prove to be the case. Um, on the one hand, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement was welcomed because it meant to say that there was a deal in place between the UK and the EU. There, were no, there would be no tariffs 
um, or, or quotas on the movement of goods between the e UK and, and the EU, and therefore there would not be any tariffs on the movement of goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. But on the other hand, the agreement, as we're probably all aware, is, is so thin that um, it barely includes any cooperation in the area of, of regulatory al alignment. Um, and so the um, way in which you might remove some of the checks and controls um, through um, sanitary, phytosanitary, regulatory alignment um, is not provided for. Um, and so the, the, the nature of the border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland that came into force with the entry into force of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement at the beginning of this year was much harder than many people anticipated. Okay. Now, as you can probably appreciate, uh, many people in Northern Ireland are, are very glad that we have not seen a return of a hard border, hard land border. But on the other hand, there's an enormous number of amount of concern about the implications of the checks and controls that we've seen introduced on the movement of goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland from the beginning of this year. The emergence um, of what is generally referred to as an Irish sea border. For many unionists, this is um, uh, utterly unacceptable um, because it's imposing um, uh, un, uh, for them regulation um, on or, or checks and controls on the movement of goods within the UK internal market is disadvantaging Northern Ireland. It's also um, uh, creating more barriers between Northern Ireland and its main market, which is Great Britain. Um, moreover, there's the political symbolism of it. Um, many uh, unionists would be concerned about the Good Friday Agreement um, as, as for them a one-way ticket towards Irish unity, um, undermining Northern Ireland's position in, or creating uncertainty about Northern Ireland's position in the UK. Um, this is only um, um, intensified, the concerns are only intensified by the introduction of, of the protocol and these checks and controls in, in the Irish Sea. It's easier to move goods between Northern Ireland and Ireland than it is to move goods from Great Britain into Northern Ireland, which is part of the United, both of which is part of the United um, Kingdom. Okay, so um, this has led to obviously enormous concerns with, within unionism, um, but it's also been highly disruptive economically in, in Northern Ireland because of the additional checks and controls that we've seen on, on goods. This has also then been, or this whole saga has been reflected in attitudes towards the UK government. I think both Nicola and Dan have sort of emphasised the fact that the um, relations between London and Edinburgh, London and Wales are, are, are strained and that there's not necessarily a huge amount of trust in, in the UK government to take up to or to look after the interests of the devolved administrations. Um, if it's if there's lack of trust in, in Scotland and Wales, um, it doesn't simply does not compare to the level of distrust within Northern Ireland. Uh, we did a recent opinion poll um, looking at levels of trust in the UK government. 6% of people in Northern Ireland exp expressed a degree of trust. 86% expressed either no trust or considerable distrust. Um, and this is a reflection of the fact that uh, um, many nationalists historically have not necessarily trusted London, but have certainly not welcomed the way in which the UK government has handled Brexit. But for many unionists, there is this huge concern they have been sold out as part of the, the process and indeed the discourse within you, uh, many um, much of unionist society unionist community is that um, that, that uh, london has betrayed them and we have a strong betrayal narrative within the politics of northern Ireland at the moment um what does all this mean for northern Ireland's position in the uk well the protocol in some respects reinforces the the, the fact that northern Ireland does occupy a unique position uh, because of the Good Friday Agreement and the terms of devolution. Um, one of the things often forgotten it, it, is that Northern Ireland is one of, I think, the only part of the only territory in the world which or has the right to secede. Um, if there is a referendum, or, um, if there is a majority, if there seems to be a majority support for the United Ireland, then the Secretary of State of Northern Ireland is obliged to call a referendum. Um, and if the referendum leads to uh, a majority in favour of unity with, with Ireland, then the, the terms of the withdrawal, terms of the Good Friday Agreement require or that 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 result to be um, respected. Okay, um, the protocol reinforces the sense that Northern Ireland is in, is in a unique position because 
Yes, it is still formally part of the United Kingdom, but it is in this very unique relationship with the European Union. You've got part of the United Kingdom, um, de facto in the customs union of the European Union, de facto in its single market, and formally under the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice for the application of EU law under the protocol. Um, for many unionists, this is obviously concerning, as I've said, um, and they are very concerned about, about, about the future, and hence we've got the, the, the very vehement opposition to the protocol and the dominant narrative within unionist, amongst unionist political parties at the moment is to scrap the, scrap the protocol, um, even though both the UK and the EU seem to be um, quite um, committed to ensure that it's continued in implementation. Um, so there's concern amongst unionists. Um, their concerns are heightened by the fact that the whole Brexit process has unleashed the debate about Irish unity. Um, the, the whole question of Irish unity is back on the agenda or, or is being discussed far more than it, I, I've certainly ever experienced it being discussed over the last um, two decades or so. Um, that's not to say that Irish unity is a foregone conclusion. Support for Irish unity has increased, but we're not anywhere near the um, majority support for that process. Um, and until such time as there is a clear majority, um, the Secretary of State is not obliged to call, call the referendum. That said, support is increasing. Moreover, a majority think that there will be a border poll within the next 10, 10 years. And indeed, I think the last opinion poll indicated that 48 um, percent think that there will be a united Ireland in the next 10 years. This is not to say that it obviously happened, but certainly Brexit has had quite a significant in, in impact on political debate in, in Northern Ireland. And not only has it increased the concerns of, amongst unionists about um, the position of Northern Ireland in, in the UK, um, but clearly it's also given uh, some, some uh, in, uh, support to the idea or, or encouragement to, to many nationalists to, in their pursuit of, of Irish unity. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens in, in 10 years. So I think like, uh, um, Dan and uh, Nicola are reserved judgment in, in saying exactly what the UK's um, external borders will look like in, in 10 years time. But uh, there's some interesting uh, dynamics that have been unleashed by this Brexit process. Great, thank you very much. Thank you all three uh, panelists. There have been a lot of questions coming in. Um, I'm going to um, put specific ones to David now, just to give you a chance to, to sort of work on them because um, uh, I'll, I'll then ask all three panellists to, to respond, but um, you've got an, almost an inevitable question about the sustainability of the Irish protocol, um, but also um, do you think that the UK really is likely to unilaterally suspend parts of it? Um, that's a question which has um, been, been coming up. But I'd like to ask you all sort of a number of general questions. I mean, what would, what would, what would the union need to do to restore faith and confidence? Um, uh, as, a, um, as an institution, as a sort of constitutional settlement, sort of politically, or has, um, have things gone too far? Has um, the sort of centralising impetus post-Brexit just been too um, um, bold, bald, unashamed, um, un unbalanced in a way, not sort of advertising what the benefits of unionism are beyond um, you know, economic support, maybe economic you know, cost subsidy? Um, or do you see, is that wrong? Is that a misunderstanding of what unionism is? Is there a much more sort of powerful um, set of ide ideological principles that, um, that, that just aren't apparent? Um, I'd like to ask you about the impact of COVID. I think that, that certainly, you know, Nicola, you, 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 you mentioned it a bit, um, but it's come up um, in other areas, in, for example, regulation, as potentially masking the consequences of the UK's departure. I wondered if you thought that was true in this in this specific in the specific case of um, devolution, independence, territorial governance in the in the UK, or does it play out differently in the three parts of the UK that you're that you're thinking about? I wondered if you thought there was a um, what the sort of constitutional path and political conditions were to a change in the territorial settlement of the UK. Um, and then um, a, a, a much more specific question has come up um, from the chats. And that's about the um, Internal Market um, Act, which has attracted a lot of um, attention from our, um, from our audience. Um, some 
argue whether there's any sort of way back from this. Is it just a, a, a naked power grab by Whitehall, by London? Um, others ask whether um, common frameworks, so-called common frameworks, could be a way of restoring confidence, possibly by a post um, Boris Johnson um, government. So there's a lot of questions there. Um, I'm asking them sort of quite slowly, hoping to give you a chance to sort of to, to wrestle with them. But um, I'm going to ask you now to, to answer some of them. Choose, choose ones you think are most important, most salient. Uh, maybe restrict yourself to, to three or four minutes. That would be great. So I'm going to go in the same order, Nicola, if that's okay. So Nicola, what do you, what do you think? Okay, it's quite a lot there. Um, I'll maybe talk about the, the internal markets one and the unionism one together. Um, was a, I mean, the Internal Markets Act is, is quite a complex piece of legislation and it was quite difficult for the issues it raises to resonate with a, a, you know, a wide public body, it's partly because there's so much else going on um, at, at the time, but also because it's quite technical and we're not really sure what the impact will be yet. Um, I worked with Dan and others on, on exploring the, the details of it and trying to get our heads around it. And there is definitely um, the, the risk that, it under, that its effect and those market access principles that Dan talked about is to undermine, potentially undermine the authority of the devolved institutions and make it much harder for them to do some of the things that they want to do. Earlier today, I was looking, having a, a wee read through the SNP manifesto to see if I could find things in there that might fall foul of internal market regulations. Um, and there are a few. And it isn't that the Scottish government won't be able to introduce new regulations and that the Scottish Parliament can't make new laws. They can, but they won't necessarily be able to force compliance with them for those who are who originate um, in other parts of the UK who are regulated and satisfy the regulations in other parts of the UK and incidentally that includes imports into other parts of the UK and um, so, so the, the, the laws that are passed just won't apply so it'll be really difficult to, to actually get a handle on the, the, the overall effect and it may well be the case that these things end up in the courts and that's when it might start to attract um, a bit more attention. Um, common frameworks are quite narrowly defined and there is provision, some provision, although it's very ambiguous within the legislation, that might protect common frameworks from um, these market access principles. Um, but it's not very clear and it doesn't really detract from the broader impact um, that the legislation will have. And part of why I want to take that alongside the idea of the union is because there are different perceptions of the union and of unionism. And the one that has driven the Internal Market Act and other, um, other decisions of the current administration is one that sees the importance of centralizing political authority that, that reifies parliamentary sovereignty, unless it means that you give parliament more say over the government, but uh, that's another issue, um, that, that sees the union as something to hold tight. Um, and that's the way that you protect it. And there's a very sort of centralizing nation building uh, agenda uh, going on here. Um, but there is another version of unionism and it's one that, that recognizes recognizes the union as a plurinational state, a series of unions of different relationships with different institutions, different identities, and is comfortable with that, that sees devolution not as something to compete with, but as something to embrace as, as part of the United Kingdom's diversity. And that idea of the union is not dominant um, within the UK government is not dominant, um, I don't think, within um, most of the Conservative uh, Party. Um, there are strands of it within the Scottish Conservatives, but only only some strands. Um, 
So of course there's a way back. There's the, things evolve all the time and there's nothing inevitable uh, here. But I, I do see the, the current version of unionism as potentially um, doing the opposite to what it's intended if its intention is to strengthen commitment to an attachment to and ultimately loyalty to uh, the United Kingdom. Great, thanks. Dan, would you like to um, answer? Yeah, thanks. Thank, thanks so much. Um, I'll try and wrap uh, a, a few of these up as, uh, as well. Um, so, so for me, I think the, the, the first thing that needs to be said is that um, the UK's constitutional arrangements, uh, the, the, the way that the UK's territorial constitution has operated, uh, for me, has been founded on uh, ambiguities and differences of opinion, difference of, differences of interpretation, um, you know, that's just the way it, it's, it's always been. Uh, I, I do think there's a sense in which, although Wales is probably the least glamorous, the least uh, attention grabbing of the, um, uh, of the parts of the UK outside England, uh, there is a sense in which the history of Wales illustrates some of the kind of established practices, the kind of taken for granted standard operating practices of the UK state about territoriality. And, and earlier on, I spoke about the continuous change that Wales has experienced since uh, the late 1990s. Well, at almost every stage of that change, um, it's been resisted by governments led by both of the main uh, GB wide parties, both Labour and Conservative, and then eventually kind of conceded so sort of grudgingly conceded. Um, uh, so that sense of there being differences of view and, uh, and, and the system, the, the arrangements working because those ambiguities could be accommodated, I think is a deeper truth about the nature of the UK's territorial constitution. And what that meant in effect, that as well as running through the devolved arrangements like um, you know, like uh, Barry Island in a stick of rock, uh, the EU also provided kind of external scaffolding that held the UK together. And when you take that away, you then have to think about what holds the UK together. Uh, uh, you know, one of the questions is what is the union for or what is the UK for? And I don't think that there are good answers to that uh, in Whitehall or Westminster. I don't think people really think about that question as a question that needs an answer. Uh, and, and that's a, an, an issue that operates not just at the level of those kind of standard operating practices, but I think it operates uh, uh, quite profoundly at the level of identity. Um, so, you know, politicians in London will often criticize uh, divisive nationalists, or if they talk about um, they talk about Wales, it tends to be if they're conservatives to kind of denigrate the failure of the NHS in Wales, and if they're Labour politicians, as has happened recently, it's to say, well, you know, Labour can do well in Wales. We should learn some stuff, although the stuff they should learn is never really very clearly specified. Uh, and what's missing there is a sense of the identity of uh, uh, of the majority nation of the UK, uh, and and you know, the idea of state nationalism and of majority nationalism, uh, you know, those are two very powerful analytical concepts. And in England, they're profoundly blurred, so that people don't really think of them. You know, as with most state nationalisms, there's a kind of banal quality to them. They get forgotten and taken for granted. They're just you know who you are, and that's why the Scots or 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 um, Sinn Fein or whoever kind of appear as divisive nationalists, whose whose um, motives should be questioned and doubted, you know, as as the first uh, as the first assumption, you know, that that. Um, uh, Now, the problem here is that that kind of blurred 
state national and majority national identity, which, which I've called um, in constitutional terms, an Anglo-British uh, imaginary, you know, the, the constitution imagined as, uh, as, as Anglo-British, a, a, a story about um, UK history, which is really an English story, but it's projected as a story for the whole of Britain or the whole of the, uh, the, the, the UK, you know, undefeated in war since 1066 and so on and so on. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, uh, it, it's a, it's it, it's a a narrative that you see reproduced actually in the white paper on the UK internal market in in several kinds of ways that has this kind of sense of a long unbroken history which distinguishes us from those uh, continentals. Um, it, it, so it's an an identity that doesn't understand itself, uh, and that makes it I think very difficult to understand other other parts of the UK and to and, and to operate in a way that kind of recognizes the particular characteristics and dynamics of um, of, of identities a, a, across these islands. And it was brought very starkly into focus, actually, by the COVID pandemic. You know, the Anglo-Welsh border uh, doesn't have the contentious qualities of the border on the island of Ireland, but unlike the Anglo-Scottish border, and like the Irish border, it's a heavily populated border that's routinely crossed all the time. Um, and, you know, when the Welsh First Minister, the Welsh government was making what seemed like relatively kind of prosaic policy decisions about where you could travel, you know, initially stopping people from the eastern side of Wales, traveling to West Wales, which early on in the pandemic had very low infection rates and so on. They were stop the police were stopping people at the end of the M4 from going into these rural places that had very poor infrastructure. Uh, and then for a while they uh, they you know we were kept in our local authority areas. Um, uh, and when the when England opened up a bit more, but Wales was a bit slower, there were several Conservative MPs. Uh, for constituencies on the English side of the border, who appeared actually to be um, kind of personally offended, sort of deeply disobliged by being told they weren't allowed to cross this border. Um, there was a sense that internal borders kind of offend this certainly conservative Anglo-British mentality, at the same time as the UK government was imposing local restrictions on, on Leicester and on, uh, on parts of, uh, of the northwest of England, and sometimes imposing them at very short notice. There was a, uh, you know, just before Eid, for example, there were restrictions put in um, uh, in the northwest of England. So it's not that they were opposed to kind of using boundaries and borders. It was just this particular border uh, kind of suddenly appeared as a, as a, as a national border on their own island. And that, I think it was very difficult for these politicians really to kind of, uh, to recognize um, and, and accept. And, and it came as a kind of personal, uh, uh, as personally disobliging in a way that I thought was actually quite, uh, quite, quite, quite revealing and makes it much more difficult to imagine kind of ways back. I mean, with, Nick, with, with Nicola, I'm absolutely sure there are ways back and, you know, effective, cooperation around common frame frameworks might be one of those paths, um, uh, uh, you know, as the, as the questions raised, but it, it, it needs something much more fundamental, I think, to change before this can uh, uh, become, um, uh, you know, a, a more um, kind of stable and cooperative set of relationships and you know and England is 85% of the population and the economy and so on so there's a sense in which you know well you know why would they why would they bother to take account of these kind of peripheral places um, as well great thanks Dan David okay thanks um, number of comments um, just picking up on, on Dan's um, comment about the union being based on, on ambiguities I think that there's a lot of truth um, behind that. And, and I think yeah, historically that those have been addressed through internal politics. Um, from a Northern Ireland perspective, with Brexit and the terms of withdrawal and the protocol, um, yes, we've still got ambiguities, 
but those are hitting up against a set of international legal obligations around the implementation of the EU law in Northern Ireland. And you can't politic that away. Um, it's a new dimension in, in the Northern Ireland um, uh, con context. Um, there, was a, there was a question in the chat which I've, I've answered um, about surely the DUP should have gone with Theresa May deal. Yes, I think <laughs> everybody realises that now, although not many people were willing to accept that view at, at the time. Um, we have the protocol. Is it sustainable? Um, I think it is. Um, there are always going to be teething difficulties with the implementation of um, the protocol. There are always going to be difficulties around um, uh, coming to terms with the disruption that Brexit was going to cause. And I think there was a fundamental underestimation of what the disruption was going to be. Moreover, we had enormous difficulties, certainly in Northern Ireland at the beginning of this year, because the terms of the UK's withdrawal in terms of the UK-EU relationship, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, were only known six, seven days before the, the protocol came in, in, into force. And we were still actually getting advice from the UK government about how to implement certain key issues um, a quarter to midnight on the 31st of December. Okay. That said, we've obviously got a highly politicised environment. Um, and yes, we do see in the headlines an enormous amount of opposition coming from, from unionists. Um, but when you look at public opinion, it's essentially evenly split on whether to have the protocol or not. Um, and certainly at the moment, um, looking to the Northern Ireland Assembly elections next year, which will obviously determine the composition of, of the Assembly for the democratic consent vote we have in 2024, um, I think the indications are that we're likely to see a return of those in, in who would support the continuation of the protocol. And that's for, for, I think, one key reason. No one has actually identified what the alternative is. Because if we don't have the protocol, you essentially go back to the debates of 2017 to 2019 about how you address the need to avoid the border on the island of Ireland. I think what's often um, not recognised in the, uh, with regard to the 2024 vote is it's not on the entirety of the protocol. It's on those elements governing the free movement of, of goods. The commitments of the UK and the EU still remain, which is to address the unique circumstances on the island of Ireland, avoid a hard border and um, um, protect the Good, the Good Friday Agreement and North-South cooperation. Um, now, it may be that someone does come up with an alternative, but uh, as certainly UK and EU officials have, have indicated, they spent four years trying to work out what the alternative was um, and couldn't find it. And I must admit, those who are calling for the scrapping of the protocol don't seem to be coming up with alternatives at the moment either. I think also it's business is broadly in favour of it in Northern Ireland, and they're the ones who are dealing with the day to day um, dis disruptions as a consequence. And although we've not seen any major concessions on the part of the EU towards the how the protocol is being implemented, um, discussions are ongoing. The framework is in, in place to try and address some of the problems which, which, which are, are raised. So I, I think um, it, it, it's too early to say, but um, uh, for the moment, I see it as sustainable. I can't see it going away. The UK government, despite its rhetoric around um, uh, unilaterally suspending elements of, of it, remains committed to its implementation. The formal line of the UK government and the EU is finding ways to make to, to implement it. Um, so the, the commitment is there. Will, will David Frost um, or the UK government follow through on threats to, to use Article 16 and the safeguard clauses? Um, I think there's a lot of rhetoric around it at the moment. Um, and I think the fact that they did not follow through um, in the early part of, of this year was partly in response to um, people pointing out the, the limits of what you can actually do under Article 16 and the um, political implications of that in terms of, the, of uh, um, engagement with, with, with the EU, um, in terms of the UK, the EU possibly taking retaliatory action um, and possibly the, the, the wider fallout there um, um, for, for it. Um, so it, it, it remains part of the UK government's rhetoric, but uh, for the moment, I can't see it necessarily being used, particularly when there's ongoing dialogue around how, what the issues are. And I think there are questions as to whether it could actually win the case in, in, in law as to whether the grounds for triggering it actually exist. Um, okay. In terms of res restoring faith, I think one of the key lessons of the last number of years is the, the unwillingness of London to necessarily either listen to um, and accommodate the views of 
um, the, the devolved, but also have structures in, in place to necessarily facilitate the dialogue and develop the, the understanding. I think the JMC system fundamentally failed. Um, and that, that needs to be um, significantly um, addressed. Um, and the common frameworks was mentioned. One of the key challenges, which is it often isn't um, addressed in that, and possibly because it only really affects Northern Ireland, is how do the common frameworks interact with the dynamic nature of the protocol and the obligations under it for Northern Ireland? Um, there's an interaction there which needs to be thought through. Um, and I'm not too sure many people have actually begun to think about it. Great, thanks very much. Um, really good answers under, under um, a lot of time pressure. Now, um, we've got five minutes left, and the problem is with these um, these kind of um, Zoom meetings is that the end is rather brutal. So rather than be guillotined, um, I'm going to first of all advertise um, our event in um, two weeks time, which is um, when we'll be welcoming, on 8th of June, we'll be welcoming distinguished Canadian historian, professor of international history in Oxford, uh, Margaret Macmillan, who'll be talking about Back to the Future, the meaning of um, global Britain, and Professor Emma Griffin from UEA will be chairing um, that, um, that meeting. Um, we've had some really great questions coming up on the Q&A, some of which our panelists have been very diligently sort of um, um, responding to. And I thought it was a, a really good question on what is London thinking, or, or in a way, is it thinking? Um, is it conscious, is it strategic, or is it just ignorant of the constitution and, um, and sort of you know, intoxicated in a way by its own um, sort of sense of of of, um, of um, victory um, in the in, in the referendum. So that was a really interesting question. There's another interesting question on the common travel area, which um, which the, the questioner su suggests might be under threat. Um, but I wonder if that is true. And then there's a sort of characterization of the Conservative Party as an English uh, national party, or as um, you know, many have said. Um, UKIP party. They're all questions that would have been great to have had your opinion on, but we're we're really way out of time. So I think I have to um, just thank you um, for joining us this evening, David, Dan, Nicola, David, especially for for stepping in at such short notice. Um, it's been great to hear your perspectives, to hear your insights, for you to share your um, knowledge with us. Um, we've greatly appreciated it, and it's just a shame we can't meet for a drink um, afterwards. So thank you very much.